Welcome to the Wisdom Lifestyle Money Show. I'm your host, Scott Dillingham. The goal of the show is to show you how you can grow personally, financially, have a larger net worth, and leverage your largest asset to help you develop the person you want to be. I take you through all the steps I did from being nothing to being told that I was nobody and I was never going to accomplish anything, from getting kicked out of high school to owning a multi-million dollar real estate portfolio in my own company with more than 20 employees. You'll meet our partners, you'll meet our friends, and you'll quickly discover how you can improve your life. So listen in and enjoy the show. Welcome everybody to the Wisdom, Lifestyle and Money show. My name is Jillian Irving. I'm a mortgage agent with Lens City Mortgages. I specialize in helping uh, real estate investors scale their portfolio. I'm also a coach as well, so I can help you <clears throat> improve your portfolio in a myriad of ways. I love to come on this podcast and talk to other professionals in the field, people who can help us save taxes, which is who we're going to speak to you today. Today, we're, we have the great pleasure of having Michael Matthew with us. He has been a professional accountant for more than 30 years. He has a Bachelor of Arts <clears throat> Bachelor of Arts from Chartered Accountants. He studies from the University of Waterloo. As a small business owner in the fields of computer and business consulting for more than 20 years, Michael has a real appreciation of the challenges and frustrations that are faced by his clients. He understands that clients want an accountant who will do more than just fill out forms. They want a trusted advisor who will add value to their bottom line. Welcome today, Michael. Thanks so much for having me here, Jillian. Oh, it's it's my pleasure. So we obviously would like, we're going to have you on many times, Michael. I feel like there's so many things that you and I could discuss, but I think primarily today, the focus of our conversation is going to be for our investors who have this new and deep interest in investing in the States. At Lens City, we have a whole new program where we can help foreign nationals purchase properties there. And honestly, we have so many investors calling us to help <clears throat> prepare them for getting, you know, mortgages down in the States. But there's a whole lot that has to happen before you can actually get a mortgage, isn't there? Yes, that's absolutely right. And it's actually a good fit for what I do because I help Canadians set up properly to do real estate investment in the U.S. And mm -hmm. one of the questions they're always asking is, how do I get financing? Mm -hmm. So the new program that you just mentioned will be of great interest to my clients for sure. So I think, you know, when people come to me and say, I need a mortgage, I say, well, you got to set up your corporate structure first. And they say, what is that? And what do I do? So can you help us understand, Michael, what, let's just start with a, a beginning investor, someone who is just getting started. So not a sophisticated investor, but just someone who might want to go and buy one property or maybe two properties in the States. What kind of entity they need to set up with you to go and do that successfully? The first question I would ask is, what is their goal? Like you mentioned, perhaps one or two properties. Is this something that they're going to use primarily for their own personal use and perhaps rent out a bit to offset the costs? Mm -hmm. Because that tends to mean they don't need to set up a lot of these more detailed structures because they're actually not running a business. If, however, though, it's meant to be a money-making venture, they want to build up some long-term cash flow from rental income, they're probably going to want to set up a corporate structure. And typically what I recommend for someone that, especially if they plan on leaving some or all of the income in the States that's generated, to use what I call a triple C structure. Mm -hmm. There's no point in Googling it because it's my term. You're not going to find any information on it. Oh, I love it. A secret, an accountant <laughs> strategy secret. That's it. <laughs> so tell us more about this. Typically, it involves setting up a Canadian corporation. So I, a lot of my clients are in Ontario. So as an mm -hmm. example, you would set up a Ontario numbered corporation. You mm -hmm. don't need a name for it because you're not going to market under this company. It's mm -hmm. not public facing. So, so it's just an Ontario company. one, two, three, four, five company. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And then you get what's called a C corporation. The U S has several types of corporations. 
you'll hear the three main ones are C Corporation, S Corporation we can dispense with quite quickly because that only applies if you're a U.S. resident. So okay. if you're doing business from Canada, that one's off the table anyway. The next one, LLC, you can use, but you have to be careful. You can't hold it directly as a Canadian. And that's because the LLC is considered to be a flow-through entity or are sometimes called a disregarded entity. That works very well if you're an American resident because you get the protection of a corporation from the legal liability concerns, but you flow through the actual income and expenses from your LLC to your personal U.S. tax return. Works great if you're, as I said, a U.S. resident. The issue is if you try to do that as a Canadian, CRA will say, well, you're claiming these foreign tax credits for the credit, the tax you paid, in this case in the U.S., where's that coming from? You say it's coming from this LLC and they stop you right there mm. because you thought you would take these tax credits from your U.S. personal tax return that you flowed through to just like the U.S. citizen or resident did, and then you claim that on your Canadian personal tax return, and you're both in the same level, both personal tax returns. Mm -hmm. The problem mm -hmm. is CRA won't allow that. They'll say you're trying to claim corporate tax credits because they're coming from an LLC. Right, you're trying right. to claim them on your personal tax return in Canada, mm -hmm. if it's matched, we won't allow that. And that's how you end up paying double tax or uh, potentially more, but you'll pay extra tax. Mm -hmm. And so if you're going to have an LLC as a Canadian resident, you have to have an intervening corporation. Mm -hmm. And that's where the C corporation comes into play. In this case, you'd have your Ontario numbered corporation, which would own the Wyoming, because that's where most of them go, C corporation, which owns the LLC. The LLC is the entity that actually takes title to the property. A lot of Ontario residents like to invest in the East Coast, so places like Georgia, Florida. Those mm -hmm. kind of places. So you would set up, say, a Florida LLC to buy your Orlando area property, and you would treat that as a disregarded entity, just like most of the other LLCs it would flow the income and expenses in this case to your Wyoming C corporation. Mm -hmm. But you'd only file in the U S for one corporation, the Wyoming one. So the first one drops out just like it does for the U S residents. The difference is if you're a U.S. resident, it goes to your personal tax return as a Canadian resident in this scenario, it goes to your Wyoming C corporation that pays the taxes. Right. And so this LLC, you said for the purposes of our illustration, you said this was a Florida LLC and that you can buy right. your property in Orlando. But what if you set up this structure and you're like, OK, I've got my Wyoming C Corp ready to go. I've got my Florida LLC. And now all of a sudden I want to buy in, you know, Ohio. That's a great question. With the C Corporation, you can all you only have to ever set up one. Mm hmm. You can then run multiple LLCs underneath that. Mm -hmm. You could run, there's no limit actually. Uh, so you could run two, five, 10, 50 for that matter. The whole point is the Wyoming corporation isn't doing business directly. Mm -hmm. or it doesn't have the legal exposure. And the reason why you'd have different LLCs is you want to separate your investments such that a problem with, say, your Orlando property doesn't affect your Ohio property. You can ab absolutely use your Florida LLC to invest in another state like Ohio. You just have to one extra step, that's all. And mm -hmm. you would have to register your Florida LLC in Ohio to do business there as what they call a foreign corporation. Mm -hmm. I get a kick out of that because are you not all in the States, but that's not how they look at it. If you're not, <laughs> your corporation isn't local to that specific state. It's considered a foreign <clears throat> corporation, but all that means it's a one-time registration fee to do business. And then everything else is the same. And are those expensive fees? I mean, is that something like you really wish you had thought about that first before you registered your LLC or is it minor and it's really not that big a deal? 
it's the latter. These mm. fees are minor, and they vary from state to state, but you're looking at in the range of 100 to 200 to maybe $300. That's mm -hmm. the cost of fees. Mm -hmm. The state's registration fees, just to start the corporation, they range from nothing up to about that. So it's hundreds of dollars, it's not thousands. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons I like Wyoming is their fees tend to be among the lowest in the country. Wyoming has no state income tax all those reasons and it everything's automated so mm -hmm. you can get companies registered in as little as two to three days if things go well and hmm. so if you I, would so if you registered um the c corp in a state other than wyoming tell tell me what that might look like i mean it's so more ex more expensive lengthier the fees are going to be more in almost every case mm -hmm. You're not going to have as good privacy protection. And also the way it assesses legal judgments, it's more beneficial in Wyoming, such that if you don't distribute from that company, your creditors can't get in to get the money. It's only if you pay money out from that company that they're able to, to yourself, that they're able to swoop in and take it. Hmm. It's called a charging order. So <clears throat> the, the other states, they're not as friendly and when it comes to all those factors. Mm -hmm. And from the tax perspective as well, too, for the state tax level, <clears throat> it sounds like it's the lowest. You know, the, the state tax level, as I said, there's no corporate income tax. There's mm -hmm. actually no personal income tax either in Wyoming. Why does everyone I'm, not live in Wyoming? Interestingly enough, it's the least <laughs> popular state in the country. What that means is you can buy a property there. You absolutely pay no income tax at the state level. The problem is you're not likely to get much appreciation because you simply don't have the demand. Mm. If it's the least popular state, that means not a lot of people want to live there in the first place. Right. <clears throat> so you have to weigh your pros and cons from a business perspective. <laughs> is there right. use and having a property that you can't sell to anyone? <laughs> And I always tell people the first thing to look for uh, where to invest is simply, is this a landlord friendly state or is this a tenant friendly state? Mm -hmm. Because in states like California, New York, New Jersey, you can have a tenant be in default for a year or more before you can kick them out. Mm, that sounds familiar yeah. <laughs> with Ontario. It's like Ontario in Texas, it's about three weeks. They're not messing around there. No, you know, don't mess <laughs> with Texas. So that's the number one criteria. I always tell people, uh, yes, you can debate about which state has a slightly better tax rate. You have a federal tax rate for corporations, which is currently 21%. That's going to apply in every state. Mm -hmm. So what you're talking about is a range of zero. I think the top state is around... 11 and a half or 12 percent but those are the states that i don't suggest you invest in anyway states like new jersey new york california with the one exception if you're flipping properties that then you can do that anywhere because you're not actually taking title in most cases you're not actually holding on to it for a long term so it, those th sorts of things don't really matter but for any longer term play, you're, you're going to want to start with that evaluation. Does this state favor tenants or landlords? Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny you should bring that up because I would say the primary reason people have been approaching us <clears throat> at Lynn City to help with their mortgages and the reason why we feel like there's this <clears throat> huge demand and surge for U.S. lending is because of exactly that, that the Ontario Landlord Tenant Board has just made it <clears throat> really difficult to do business here, right? And people are finding it hard to be able to evict tenants in any sort of expeditious way. And so they're looking to move their money into areas where there is a more landlord-friendly environment to, to connect business, really. Yeah, I, I'm a landlord myself in Ontario, and I've experienced some frustrations around trying mm -hmm. to get a tenant to move out because there was a pest problem, frankly, cockroaches. And 
I was so stubborn. I didn't want to pay them to leave, but that's actually encouraged in the Ontario market is mm. to pay tenants to leave. Yep. And that just struck me as why would I want to reward someone for, you know, damaging my property? Right. <clears throat> I was talking to a property manager, a friend of mine, and she said, you have to remember the landlord and tenant board is not there to kick tenants out of their homes. So if they can find any excuse possible to not do it, yeah. they will not do it. Mm -hmm. Right down, including you make some simple clerical error on your paperwork. They don't allow you to just cross it out, initial it, and keep going. You have to start all over and get a brand new hearing. And it's just craziness it's yeah it's not, very frustrating not to get too political but the, the politicians keep going on and on about housing crisis and we've got to do something to improve it and they keep trying to tinker with demand when they should really be concentrating on increasing supply mm -hmm. and one of the ways to increase supply is to have a fair landlord and tenant board that doesn't cater to the tenants so much that they can continue not paying rent for a year or more before they're kicked out. And the, even when you get the order, it's not like they leave the next day. No. Right? Weeks down the road, and then the police do not get involved. The sheriff is the only one who can legally kick your delinquent tenants out. Mm -hmm. And the sheriff posts a notice, and he, again, it's not the next day. So even after you, quote, won at trial, it can be a couple of months before you even get into your property. So mm -hmm. it's definitely stacked against you and that and also the high prices of entering into the real estate market in the greater Toronto area and the Vancouver area in particular is what is encouraging my clients to look to the U.S. because you can get into properties for much less money. Yeah, 100%. That's what I'm seeing across the board. You know, People, Ontarians who look at homes for sale really anywhere in the States, and they come back to me excitedly and said, the number starts with a two. <laughs> and they can't really believe it that there's actually a house that might cash flow um, that you can buy that's not a shack that is in the $200,000. You know, it feels exciting to be able to help people um really to scale businesses in the States and for us to be able to help them more readily now from Canada with tons of financing <clears throat> options. So let's jump back into this, these LLCs again, because you made a comment that was interesting to me. You said, if you had two LLCs, you might want to protect what's happening in one state from properties, like from what was happening with properties in another state. Do you try to stack your LLCs up to a certain value, Michael? Is that what you try to do? You say, once we get to $500,000 with properties in Florida or wherever it is, then we're going to make another LLC just to keep the value of them kind of distributed just so that there doesn't, does that make sense? Just so that you don't have too much exposure in one company? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And yes, generally speaking, people have a rule of thumb and it's somewhere for most people between 500,000 and a million dollars worth of properties. Once they cross that threshold, they will then look to have another LLC opened up to purchase the next property. Mm -hmm. It comes down to peace of mind, which only the client can value versus cost to maintain and set up. I can certainly tell the client what it's going to cost to set up another LLC, what the anticipated cost is to maintain it year to year. But what I can put a price on is their peace of mind such that some people may say, you know what? I don't think I'm going to get sued. I've got good insurance in place. I don't mind having four or five, six properties in the same entity. Mm -hmm. Other people may say, you know what? I ran into a problem where there's one problem tenant at one property. And then all my real estate holdings were all of a sudden at risk because this guy decided that'd be a good place to break an arm and sue me because I didn't maintain a, a safe home for him. And I'd rather have everything carved off into a separate entity. Yes, I know it's going to cost me more, but then I don't have to worry that a problem with one property is going to take down everything else I own. <clears throat> and I get to have more assets accumulated. It's going to be more of an issue. 
it's say that $200,000 property and you buy another $200,000 property, most people will be comfortable just leaving those two in the same structure. But it's at the end of the day, the client's option because they're the one who has to sleep at night and not me. Right. And do you feel like the litigious nature of the states? I mean, people do sue there more than they do here. I mean, it really does sound like a consideration. I mean, I'd never thought about that as a property owner here in Ontario with several rental properties. I do have different holding companies for my properties just because they've been around for so long. But I've never really thought about people suing me for breaking their arm, but maybe I should, even for my Ontario properties. The way, the way I look at it is you have to assess the risk. And to me, having 10 individual homes is less risky than have one 10 unit apartment building. Mm. It seems like everyone has at least one idiot friend. And if you're concentrating <laughs> those 10 idiot friends in one building, the chance of having a problem goes up exponentially mm -hmm. versus 10 single family homes. You have to evaluate the risk. And while you need insurance, especially if you have a catastrophic loss, such as a fire or flood damage, insurance companies are pretty good at figuring out ways to not pay you. That's true. As, a, as an example, most people would be surprised to learn that if their rental unit lies vacant for more than 30 consecutive days, they have no insurance coverage whatsoever. Mm. The standard in the industry is, and I'm talking in Ontario, that the policies lapse or avoid after 30 days of not being occupied. Mm. And personally, it's taken me two to three months maybe even four months to rent my place out on several occasions. And had there been a problem during that time frame, I would have been on the hook potentially mm. myself, although uh, at least for some of that time, my policy explicitly had, I think it was 120 days of coverage. So right. you can get these extra coverages, but you have to be aware of the need in the first place. Right. Now, back to sort of setting up these corporations, again, so many of the people who I'm talking to about who are really just starting their, you know, their research into the states and purchasing their, you know, they're being told that <clears throat> what they should do first is to shop and find the property and then open up their entity. And I'm not sure that is the correct order. What would you recommend for people who know they want to get started soon is it best to wait or is it best to just get started with the setup of this entity now? If you're committed to proceeding, then it makes more sense probably to start setting up your entities. And the reason is in order to open up a bank account, you're going to need what's called an employer's identification number. Even if you don't have any employees, that's what the U.S. calls their tax ID number for corporations. If you have a business in Canada, you know that CRA issues you a business number, this nine digit number. The equivalent in the States is this EIN. And the IRS is the only entity that can issue these EINs and they sometimes are quite busy. So we're okay now, but starting sort of March to May, because they're dealing with so much personal taxes, what should take perhaps two to three weeks can take two to three to four months to get that EIN issued. And while you need it to file your taxes, the more pressing concern is you're gonna need it to open up a bank account for your US entity. You cannot open up a bank account without it. Right. So, so you could have the best property in the world and you can't get it because you're waiting for the IRS to give you this EIN and it might be weeks or even possibly months for that to happen. Possibly months. and. Yeah, obviously there are ways around it, but in an ideal world, mm. you don't want to have to ship properties around from one entity to another at the last minute if you can avoid it. So yes, if you're committed, by all means, get its things set up. Uh, to set up a numbered Ontario corporation, I mean, I say a week, uh, just between us though, it can be happening that much faster, especially if there's, just a, if there's no name it's, and it is truly a numbered company. And 
setting up the C Corp and the LLC takes usually about two weeks. The fly in the ointment, so to speak, is that EIN number because they're very, you think CRA is procedural, IRS is so much more procedural that there's no possibility of hurrying them along. As an example, I received some correspondence for, from the IRS and I had to forward a response, which I did. And rather than read my response, which I thought they would do, they just sent a letter saying, yeah, we know you sent us something, but we need 45 days to read it. I'm thinking, just read it. Why are you sending me this letter? <laughs> you're like, you could have read it in the time it took you to respond to the letter saying, you're not going to read it for 45 days. <laughs> exactly. So there's just no hurrying on them along. Right. People get the EIN uh, documentation. If they somehow misplace it, the IRS refuses to reissue a copy. Again, I don't know why. It's, so you'd have to apply again. You have to apply for this not the EIN number, you have to apply for a confirmation and it's a different process and it's a whole thing. And the only reason I know is because mm -hmm. I've had clients that did that. They lost the paperwork. All right. So public service paperwork. announcement. If you get an EIN, take a picture of it. <laughs> <Don't use> it. <laughs> yes. Take a picture of it so that you can reproduce <laughs> it for the bank because the banks want to see the original letter from the I IRS. They won't just say, what's the number? They want to see the actual document. Oh, fascinating. And what are there sort of classic mistakes that you see? Do you have people who come to you or they're like, oops, I set that up. That was not correct. And you are, try to tidy up the messes for people or do people come to you with preconceived ideas and you are mostly in the education game saying that's not the way I would set it up? I'm just wondering if there's like mistakes that people make that you're like, wow, I wish I had known or I would have done better had they come to me first. <laughs> I, I think of it as a mistake if they're, buying a property that they're going to be renting out over the long term even if it's a short-term rental but they're doing mm -hmm. it you know, year after year and they did it in their personal name mm. uh, the problem What's the mistake had, with that the problem we had is i want that to be in the llc and to mm. move it that would trigger in canada capital gain if the property is appreciating and in this case it was in florida in a growth area so even though they just bought it, I think the year before, it, the price had gone up more than six figures, which means half of that gain is taxable in Canada because when you move it from one entity to another, that's considered a taxable transaction. Right. And there's no rollovers that apply to foreign corporations. Mm -hmm. so we just said, ugh. Let's not and do it, that again. <laughs> Let's get a good insurance policy and hope you don't have a problem with this property, but future properties should be set up in a corporation from day one. Other mistakes are just not following up with the various bits of paperwork that has to be submitted on a timely basis, not understanding that while we have a similar tax system, it's not identical. And so they have different requirements in the U.S., and you basically need to be on top of things. And what I do is I work with American CPAs who handle all the entity creation in the US and they also file all the tax returns and also the information returns. Those don't involve taxes directly, but that love letter I referred to earlier for, I received from the IRS was because they said you paid money to a related foreign entity, i.e. yourself, and you didn't file this information return, please send us $10,000. And that got my attention. <laughs> yes, it would. <laughs> and I don't file my own U.S. tax uh, re return. So I contacted the same CPAs that I just mentioned and say, I know we filed an extension to file the corporate tax return, and I know we filed it well within the extension time frame. Yes, that's correct. Now, just curious, no real reason. Did you happen to file this information return related to related party payments? He said, oh, absolutely. That's a very important form to file. I said, oh, good. Why? Because the IRS <laughs> friends, I didn't file it and they won $10,000. Oh, no, we filed it. And why did they send this? Oh, they don't know. They have it. What happens? 
a lot of companies just pay it. So here's a left hand, right hand thing where one department, the IRS received the document. The other one just sent out this notice because there was a related party payment. They were hoping you might just pay. You're hoping you <laughs> pay. It's a pretty uh, good no. strategy. <laughs> okay. But I could see how that would be incredibly stressful for a new investor who was starting out there who didn't know all of these things, right? That would kind of make you want to be sick if you got the, you owe me $10,000. So I am assuming then, like you were saying, that if someone were to set up their corporation with you, that all of those reporting and information requirements would be something that you would take care of on That's everyone's right. behalf. That's right. In coordination with my American CPA colleague, mm -hmm. all that is dealt with, right? It's just up to the client to get their details in terms of the transactions took place during the year, mm -hmm. on a timely basis. And provided that's done, then everything falls into place after that. And then do you, do you also do just regular bookkeeping as well? Is that a service you would offer for someone who is setting up their properties that you do the, the monthly expenses and all that kind of stuff as well? Or is that something that they would have to take care of? I, I, I can handle that. Uh, I don't directly do it myself because I'm frankly too expensive. Mm -hmm. But I do work with a bookkeeper that can handle various types of assignments. And that's something that he could do. And it's a good idea at least starting out for the clients to do it maybe for a year or two just to get some familiar familiarity with the file mm -hmm. but it's not something they have to do on an ongoing basis and especially if they're investing in a big way they have multiple properties it's too much it's too much work for them and it's going to bog them down and for sure they would need to work with a bookkeeper you know more or less from the start because what they do well is find and fund properties, they're not bookkeepers because if they were, they'd already be doing it as a business. So any last tips for new investors as they start on their journey to investing in the U.S.? Get some education mm -hmm. and take action. You, mm. you need both because there's some people that get no education, just take action and end up spending a lot of money digging themselves out of the hole they've created and other people who are reluctant to take any action until they know everything. You're never going to know everything. The deal is a good deal because it's generating the return that you're looking for. Just understand you will have some extra costs. No question about it. There is some extra complication, but that, that's, it's factored in to whether it's a good deal or not. Mm -hmm. So as long as you understand those factors, then you'll be fine. That sounds like fantastic advice. And if um, our listeners want to reach out to you to get your help in setting up this myth mythical three-stage corp that only you do, where can they find you, Michael? The easiest way to get a hold of me is through email at michael, that's M-I-C-H-A-E-L, at askmichael.ca. So michael at askmichael.ca. That sounds great. And of course, if anyone needs assistance with the U.S. mortgages, you can reach out to me directly as well at Jillian at LendCity.ca. And Michael and I are looking forward to helping you with your next U.S. purchase. Thank you very much, everyone. And I hope to see you back here soon. Thanks, everyone. Bye now. If you're serious about real estate investing and you want to take it to the next level with the least amount of time and mistakes, then you're going to want to sign up for our Real Estate Investor Hub. Visit CanadianRealEstateNetwork.com and hit the blue button or banner that says Free Investor Resources. Inside, you'll have access to real estate investing courses, networking opportunities, webinars featuring industry professionals as well as dedicated chat channels to share and get access to unique properties. I look forward to seeing you there.